a reading from the book of the prophet Daniel. As I watched, thrones were set up, and the Ancient One took his throne. His clothing was bright as snow, and the hair on his head as white as wool. His throne was flames of fire, with wheels of burning fire. A surging stream of fire flowed out from where he sat. Thousands upon thousands were ministering to him, and myriads upon myriads attended him. The court was convened, and the books were opened. As the visions during the night continued, I saw one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. When he reached the ancient one and was presented before him, the one like a son of man received dominion, glory, and kingship. All peoples, nations, and languages served him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not be taken away. His kingship shall not be destroyed. Febum Domini. A reading from the second letter of St. Peter. Beloved, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that unique declaration came to him from the majestic glory. This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. Moreover, we possess the prophetic message that is altogether reliable. You will do well to be attentive to it, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Febum Domini.
Dominus vobiscum. Lexio Sancti Evangelium Secundum Matthew. Jesus took Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, conversing with him. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell prostrate and were very much afraid. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and do not be afraid. And when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one else but Jesus alone. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, Do not tell the vision to anyone until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Verbum Domini. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. What we do here every morning, what every Catholic parish does every morning, is to celebrate the liturgy, the liturgy of God, the liturgia in the Greek, the work of God, And what liturgy does is it remembers. It remembers the work of God in creation. It remembers the salvific work of God as he seeks to redeem and recreate his creation. And it also brings hope, expectation. The liturgy excites expectation in the hearts of the believers, expecting God to act to renew, to transform, to intervene in history. It is the motif of the heart of the believer to hope in the Lord, to expect God to act. And all of this becomes reality through the liturgy. It becomes life. Liturgy becomes life. Listen to him, the Father says from the cloud. He says it to Peter, James, and John, and through them, he says it to the entire church for all time. Listen to the Lord. Let the liturgy, the work of God, this act of worship, become your life. Let it permeate your very being. And when our life has been permeated by God, by this act of worship, that life leads back to liturgy. It returns back to God. It is as if we receive from God our life, our renewal, our transformation, our transfiguration, and we return it back to him, to glorify him, to acknowledge him, to give him Eucharist, thanks, praise, adoration, glory. And it returns again, for that liturgy again seeks to permeate life. Once more, this is the way that we live, the heart of worship. This is the manner in which we enter into the flow of the entire Holy Trinity, the communion of God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It is through liturgy 
Liturgy leads to life, and life but must be immersed in liturgy. The reason I emphasize this on this Feast of the Transfiguration is because this feast falls between, in the Jewish historical context, the event of the Transfiguration falls between two key Jewish feasts, Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And this speaks of this liturgy to life and life to liturgy. Because the Lord, who is the ultimate revealer of the Father's plan, he is the Word. He is act itself, that which will atone, that's what, with, that which will redeem. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, also known as the Feast of Lights, commemorates the desert wandering, Israel's Exiting from Egypt, from that place of slavery of the heart, that place wherein they had been seduced and allured by Egypt, and into the desert they went for 40 years. And there they pitched these tents, and there they learned how to depend upon God. Liturgy which took place at the foot of Mount Sinai, also commemorated in this transfiguration of Jesus. There we see Moses. There we see Elijah, the law and the prophets, God revealing his way, the law, and the prophetic word that speaks to us in the present moment to direct our way, to remind us, to point out to us how we still need to be purified. The transfiguration of Jesus atop this mountain, it brings liturgy and life together. God continues to show us the way, and he continues to illumine the path of our lives. And it is through this act of worship, a continual act as the prophet Micah said, from the rising of the sun to its setting, may the name of the Lord be praised. John also speaks of this Feast of Tabernacles. John remembers Jesus as he is celebrating this feast. In the seventh chapter of his gospel, this particular encounter on the greatest and highest day of the feast that Jesus has in the temple area. On the last and greatest day of the feast, reads John 7, 37, Jesus stood up and exclaimed, Let anyone who thirsts come and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture says, rivers of living water will flow from within him. He said this in reference to the spirit that those who came to believe in him were to receive. Liturgy leads to life. When we worship God, when we enter into this act of worship with mind, heart, soul, strength, the very Shema of Israel, our own profession, the Lord says, that from within our own hearts will be rivers of living water. Our faith will give faith to others. It will excite them to hope, excite them to believe, so that they might receive from God the gift of his life, of his love. This is liturgy and life. What you do here is precisely what God himself has revealed to be done. You're in a holy and sacred place. You enter into the holiest and most sacred act that any man or woman could enter into. And this is what can transform and transfigure us into light. This is what empowers and enables our minds to hear God's word, to allow the law to be revealed in our lives. It is here that we know 
God's plan, that we discover what he is calling us to do in the present moment. We live in a world that deeply needs to enter and understand what liturgy and life is all about. We live in a world where there are millions who do come to Mass to worship the living God, and there are millions more who worship God with the Word, who worship God with their hearts. We live in a cynical world, one that does not necessarily believe that religion takes any for place in economy, in politics, in the making of decisions that truly unite the world in a global way. We live in the world that no longer believes that Jesus is the Redeemer. A world that predominantly doesn't even know the Word of God. How is that to spread that truth? We, we who believe, we must become the rivers of living water. Every man or woman who sees and encounters a believer they can't help but notice and recognize there's something profoundly different about that man or that woman. We must transfigure the face of the earth, and we can do it by the manner in which we worship, immersing all humanity in this heart of worship. Immerse our government in this act of worship today. Immerse every person who's been elected from the highest official in the land to the ones who are locally invested to care and to guide and to legislate. Immerse them in the heart of worship. Place them in this Eucharist. By name, by face, by act, by state, by region, whatever, however you do it. This is liturgy in life. Immerse your families, your friends, all those who beg for your prayers, those who you promise to pray for, those whom you don't know. This is how we transfigure the world that God created. Because it must be renewed. It must be redeemed. And God is looking to us to bring that redemption. May the Lord sanctify our hearts in this act of worship. And may he strengthen our resolve, increase our faith, and give us a deep hope that he will and is intervening in history.